I mentioned that this module onwards, we have learning theorist of the day. And so I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to learning theory, a very brief introduction to learning theory, just to put that into context. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, people have wondered or had ideas about how we as humans learn and develop. Um, and some of that nowadays with modern science and neuroscience and stuff has kind of maybe been backed up by, by science, others perhaps not so, but I guess it's very natural, isn't it, for us as a human, uh, as a human race to wonder, you know, how, how is it that we think and grow and develop and be? Um, some of these learning theorists might be useful for us to know about as forest school leaders because they've got kind of ideas that they've they've put out there that if we know about them might help us support the learners that we're working with so part of the forest school qualification um, asks you to explore relevant learning theorists and sort of see how they're relevant to forest school and and in particular if there are some that jump out at you um, we'd like you to at least, like pick at least one that will that you could implement some of their ideas and put it into practice in, in your forest school practice um, but there are like hundreds of different people out there so we're only going to touch on a few but I wanted just to give you a bit of background because there are sort of different genres of learning theorists um, and this kind of covers both the, like the educational realm but also the like, psychological realm as well in terms of uh, the more therapeutic aspects, I suppose, as well. But I think that is relevant because forest school is quite a therapeutic approach. So I want to just briefly mention four different genres that you could kind of lump learning theorists into. Um, I'm guessing that as sort of educators, you're going to kind of I've heard of some of these. I apologise in advance because I don't think I can spell any of these four words properly, but um, hopefully, hopefully we'll get there. The first one is behavioralists. So I'm sure you may have come across behavioralists, particularly if you work in a school that still operates on sanctions and rewards. Behave, behavioralists? Maybe, maybe not. Behavioralists. Um, so you perhaps have heard of someone called Pavlov and his dogs where he can kind of condition them to salivate by ringing a bell uh, and when they when he gave them food and then eventually he didn't need the food to be there to get them to salivate so you've got people like Pavlov you've got people like Skinner BF Skinner and his experiments on rats which pretty much the education system is built on Skinner's work in terms of that, that sort of conditioning. Now, um, <clears throat> the main gist of the belief of behavioralists is that there is no free will, that we purely respond to our environments and respond to stimuli. So a behavioralist would say that you're not kind of thinking and uh, actively involved in your learning and development, you just respond. That's all you do. You just respond to what's around you in terms of the physical environment, in terms of the social environment. Um, and Skinner's work in particular was about kind of conditioning the fact that you can, you know, you can train a rat to solve a maze through using rewards um, to, you know, get them to copy certain behaviours and things. Um, and as I say, Skinner's work is still kind of prevalent in schools in some ways, in terms of that rewards, sanctions based way of working with people. You're trying to, in, in that methodology, you're trying to condition children and people to do what you want. And if they don't, they get punished. If they do, they get a reward. Yeah, it's that conditioning approach. Uh, ironically, obviously, we still use bells as well to, con to condition certain behaviour, to line up or whatever after break time as well uh, with, with Pavlov. So that's kind of where the, the behavioralists are coming from. But then some 
theorists kind of were like, well, that's, is that right? That, you know, that seems too simple. That doesn't seem quite the ticket when it comes to human beings. Um, surely we are more actively involved and construct our own understanding of the world around us rather than just being passive receivers that are kind of going to be, um, you know, changed on the external stimuli. So there's constructivists, constructivists, and there are different types of constructivists. But for example, Piaget, you've probably heard of, of Piaget, who was like one of the first uh, around, and he was looking particularly at cognitive abilities. So he would be considered a cognitive constructivist. And he watched, well, he watched his own children grow from infants up. Um, but through his observations, he noticed that, that they weren't just passively responding, that he believed that they were actively making up mental constructs of understanding and through their perceptions of what's happening. And he also would talk about stages of development that um, you go from like the sensory motor stage in young childhood through to is it the concrete operational or so that there are like four stages that you would move through um, and he believed development was like a one-way street in in that sense um, there's also the Gotsky uh, who we will, he'll be the theorist of the day tomorrow. So we'll talk more about him tomorrow. But he was very much socially uh, interested in the social environment. He was a social constructivist. Um, but also other people like Montessori would be considered a constructivist. Montessori. Uh, the theorist of the day is Froebel. He would be in there too. Yeah, so Montessori schools are based on the theory of Maria Montessori. Yeah, yeah. Who, um, yeah, she, well, she's worth looking up if you haven't come across her, but she did, she was the first, like, doctor, female doctor in Italy. <laughs> and um, she did a lot of work with what we would refer to now as learners with special educational needs and through her observations of working with those children. Um, she came up with certain, I guess, practices that she found work well, but a lot of it was to do with, you know, practically doing things and the connection between the hands and the minds and to be doing things practically. Montessori also talked about things having to be size appropriate. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, in early years we have small chairs and small tools. It's because of Montessori pointed that out because up until then children were considered, I suppose, um, you know, had to fit into an adult world and things. Um, but yeah, there's obviously all of these people did lots and lots and lots. And I'm just giving you a brief summary. But yeah, so, so you've got behaviourists and constructivists, which are um, sort of this has kind of grown out of that one, if, if you like. This one was like a response to wanting to describe humans as more than just uh, more than just being passive you know like an em behavioralists imagine humans to be a blank slate uh, that that is waiting to be filled or changed by environmental stimuli whereas constructivists are like no there's internal mechanisms going on that that we actively are part of <coughs> then the um the next one on the list this is perhaps more psychological rather than educational, but the, the psychoanalysts, I can never say, sorry, psychoanalysts, maybe something like that, psychoanalysts. Um, and so this is basically stemmed from Sigmund Freud being like in his work um, and it, his work was continued by his daughter Anna Freud as well uh, it would also include people like Eric Erickson and uh, Carl Jung would also be kind of under that bracket of psychoanalysts uh, so psychoanalysts believe that 
a lot of our motivations and behaviours are driven by our unconscious minds. Um, and that we're like an iceberg, if you like, with just the tip of the iceberg being our conscious mind and then everything else is underneath the surface that we're not kind of consciously aware of. Which is why Freud um, and the psychoanalysts did a lot of like work with dreams and um, you know, with dream interpretation and like the ink blot tests where you kind of say what it reminds you of or uh, word associations and things like that. Um, uh, Eric Erickson, one of his main theories was like the eight stages of man where he believed that at certain points in a lifetime there'd be these psycho, he called them psychosocial crises which needed to be resolved and depending on how they were resolved would have a particular outcome. So like for example in the first year of life the psychosocial crisis is around trust versus mistrust. So if you think back to last module when we looked at the brain this is actually something that sort of exists in the brain in terms of that attachment and that your needs are being met in infancy and how um, if your needs aren't met, your brain will be wired in a certain way, or if they are, you know, you've got a secure attachment and everything's met, then it will be wired in a different way. And he believed that if you went through that first crisis uh, with a sense of, of trust, then the result is hope. Um, and but so there's these stages um, throughout childhood so there's another one you know in early childhood and then later childhood teenagehood all the way through to death which um the final one is a bit uh, dramatic because the outcome is despair possibly if you don't resolve that one um, but it's quite it's quite interesting um and Carl Jung he um was particularly interested in things like the collective unconscious how he believed that we didn't just have an unconscious mind for ourself, that we could also access like the culture's collective unconscious. Um, and he did a lot of work around archetypes and how particular archetypes kind of come up in our stories, in our music, in, in our kind of culture. There are these archetypes hidden in plain view and, and that are deeply familiar to us. Um, which there is, there's other research around this in terms of like the hero's journey. Have you come across the hero's journey? Which basically um, it's to do with, there's a pattern in storytelling that we, that resonates very deeply, almost instinctually with us as humans. And there was a guy called Joseph Campbell who went round talking to all sorts of cultures across the planet, including indigenous cultures, kind of collecting their stories. And he basically kind of saw similarities and patterns in them. Um, and he, he called it like the hero's journey. And, and even in modern day times, so like if you take Star Wars, like the original Star Wars, not the recent rubbish, like the original Star Wars, George Lucas used, con he knew, Joseph, he met Joseph Cadwell, he consciously used the hero's journey in that story. And even on a modern day thing, you know, that's, what was that, back in the 70s, wasn't it? And we're still kind of embracing that story. You can see it in other stories as well, like Lord of the Rings and stuff as well. I, I don't know whether Tolkien consciously used it, but there's these patterns that come up. Um, and, and in terms of archetypes, you see those archetypal figures, like, you know, the wise king, for example, is an archetypical fi figure. The god of war, the mother nature, there, there are these archetypical energies, if you like, that, that we recognise under it from an unconscious kind of level um, which is pretty cool and just just on a side note in terms of forest school storytelling can be really powerful as a tool when you're working particularly if you're working with behavior um, kids you know kids that are struggling or vulnerable kids because and, and as I understand it it's very common for indigenous cultures if there's a problem with a person they'll tell a story and that's the way like they manage behavior if you like so say there'd been a dispute or something has happened 
they, they tell a story that had metaphors in it that the person could identify with but it's a gentler way of dealing with things because you're not focusing on the individuals, you're not calling them out, you're not putting the spotlight on them, but they're perhaps being able to identify with the characters within the story and, and kind of what happens in the story. Um, and it, so Indigenous people have been doing storytelling in, as part of, I guess, education, as part of uh, supporting young people's behaviours forever but in recent years it has been backed up with neuroscience as well so Margot Sunderland who's one of the neuroscientists has looked at um, like the brain in terms of what happened it's not when you're reading storybooks it's when you're orally telling a story or creating a story and uh, there is notable differences in terms of what the brain's up to when you're orally telling a story or listening to it rather than reading it from a book um, and she's got, I think she's got a book called like working using storytelling to support behavior or something so um, there is some science to back that up I've gone off piste a little bit there that kind of with storytelling but those are the psychoanalysts so it's all about the unconscious mind that's driving our behaviors and m motivations so then finally uh, out of our four themes we've got the humanists humanists or humanistic psychologists humanists now we've already we've already come across one of those last <laughs> module uh, we talked about self-esteem and we looked at Carl Rogers Carl Rogers is a humanist um, and also probably someone you've come across before is Maslow Abraham Maslow and so humanistic psychology kind of became a big thing in the sort of 70s, 80s. And again, it's kind of evolved as a response to some of, well, particularly the behaviorists and the psychoanalysts. Because in a way, well, certainly psychoanalysts are also saying that we don't really have free will because, you know, we're being driven by our unconscious parts of our mind kind of thing. Whereas the humanists believe that that's not the case. They like to believe that there is free will and that we are able to... So both of these theories talk about self-actualization, that as humans, we can reach our full potential, that everyone... It, humanists recognise that there's a uniqueness to every individual, that we all kind of bring our own gifts to the world and that we have the ability to self-actualise. It's a very hopeful way of looking at humanity, I suppose. You know, there's a default. There's a default to consider that, generally speaking, humans are good or have good intentions un that underlies this this humanistic psychology. Um, that they might be born into dodgy circumstances, and there might be behaviour that's not desirable. But underneath it all, that there's a undercurrent of goodness in humans is where humanist which is why it's called humanist psychology um, so in terms of forest school there may be parts of all of these that might be useful to know about and with learning theorists the way I see it is use it like spice take little bits from here and there to make up a unique combination for you, for your forest school practice, for your group, for your situation. Like some of it, I find some of this really fascinating, it's really fascinating, but you can obviously get quite deep into it. And within anything, there's, there's always like disagreements and conflicts and challenges about, um, about certain theories. But like, so some people kind of obviously, it's, they're very academic and, you know, there's, there's arguments about, oh, I think Froebel meant this. No, I think Froebel meant that. And I think that's not, that's not really useful to us. The, what's useful to us as practitioners is to know a bit about some of these theories that we think are relevant and that could help, that help us work with people. So, like, for example, I found knowing about Rogers' person-centred um, 
ways of being, like what he says about trying to be in congruence, trying to close that gap so that we can increase people's self-worth, having genuine kind of connection and empathy with people. I find that useful to think about when I'm working at Forest School. So I, I find that one very useful. And in terms of the actual ethos and beliefs of Forest School, that recognising that we are all unique, and I do like to think that there is an element of free will within people. So, you know, I'm kind of operating quite often on humanist sort of approaches. However, you know, there's other parts, you know, knowing that we can actively construct our own understanding of the world helps me as a practitioner think about, well, how do I present information? You know, I don't want to be a teacher director type person where I'm trying to just fill them with facts and knowledge. We want dynamic learning experiences where they can experiment and try things out and figure stuff out and fail sometimes and try again and make sense of things. Uh, as I've said, I kind of went off on a bit of a tangent, but, you know, understanding, um, particularly if you're working with vulnerable kids or those with behavioural needs, understanding that there might be stuff under the surface that might manifest when you're out at forest school that you don't, they might not even be conscious that they're doing it. You know, there is elements of psychoanalyst stuff there. And as I said, storytelling, I'm a big fan of storytelling and archetypes. And then even behavioralists, you know, like even though I find like pure behavioralism a little bit harsh, you know, as in, I don't think we're necessarily exactly the same as rats and pigeons that Skinner did his experiments on. Um, but there might be times where I do use behavioral conditioning, like, you know, how to use a knife, how to move around a fire is conditioning people uh, in terms of like the games and stuff we might play um, because they're, it's about safety. So usually the only time I drop into behavioralism at forest school is around health and safety elements. But you know, sometimes that's, that's important. You know, we need to do a bit of that sometimes.